Kiwi startup Kami started as a note-taking app, but has developed into a suite of digital classroom tools, which saw its popularity skyrocket during COVID lockdowns. But how has Kami business itself coped with COVID challenges on the back end, including engaging staff and being efficient with cash? Kami's CEO and co-founder Henji Wang joins me virtually to talk through the issues. Hi, Henji. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. So tell me, how has Kami managed to scale and grow even through a tough employment conditions that we've seen and tech companies sort of falling a bit out of favor um, with the investment market? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, so, I mean, if you take a step back, let, let me just describe Kami. You know, we're the leading, interactive leading uh, learning platform. It's built to transform basically any learning resource into a far more engaging piece of content and allows kids to really collaborate on it. So, you know, from day one, we've built to be a globally scaled business, but also having to be very capital um, efficient. So we've focused on great unit economics. We've been uh, very deliberate in our spending, but also doing it in a way that allows us to, you know, take the right next step and do that well um, and resource that correctly. I mean, and regular NBR readers, you know, will have followed your progress throughout the, the years. We've, we've reported on, on you guys uh, uh, a few times in the past few years and, and your, your capital raising. And, and But in terms of the, the cash reserves, I mean, how have you been able to be efficient through this this period, um, you know, in order to obviously make big gains on the, on the front end, but uh, um, maintain the business structure on, on the back end? Yeah, so... We were the fastest, and we still are, I think, the fastest growing business in New Zealand, fastest growing exporter. So um, on one hand, we've scaled up our business significantly. We've grown our revenue base uh, incredibly, our customer base as well. And uh, But on the other hand, we've also had to scale up our staff to be able to match that, that sort of demand that we're seeing. So um, while we've had to be very deliberate and frugal with how we spent and make sure that we haven't overhired. We've also had great unit economics um, from the start. So, um, you know, we're, we're always trying to have this real tricky balance between spending within our means, but also focused on growth uh, and making sure we don't um, break the bank while we're at it. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'm sure many startups and young companies have that a problem um, or that balance they try to find. I mean, what can you give me some examples of, um, I suppose the, the frugality um, where you're able to, to to find those efficiencies within the business. Let me have put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one one way that we've been able to build a really successful business is uh, the way that we've done our marketing. So, a lot of our marketing um, before this year, we hadn't spent a dollar on advertising. It was all grown through word of mouth. Uh, it, there was a lot of people who loved the product, who advocated for it massively at different conferences. And we focused our uh, marketing resources on inbound marketing, on, uh, ab on, on on these advocates that would go around and train folks on, on Kami. So that's one example of how we've been able to scale so quickly um, because that kind of marketing can scale without, uh, with a minimum amount of sort of um, investment. Yeah. Do you have any advice for other sort of local startups who are, um, you know, going through this, trying to build a long-term roadmap, but, you know, also have an eye, obviously, on the, on the cash burn? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to getting to product market fit and making sure that you are actually in product market fit before you go and uh, spend a lot of resources on scaling. You know, we think that a lot of startups tend to try and, scale or overscale before they've actually hit PMF. Um, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the smaller your team size is, the faster you can iterate and be agile, there's less momentum that you have to resist when you have to change tact. Um, and for us, it meant that we had a really small team early on, uh, focused on customers, what their needs are, building out solutions for them, making sure that it was it was extremely effective in the classroom for students and teachers and for that digital transformation that we were embarking upon before we went and deployed a lot of cash uh, on, on some of these scaling initiatives. So, um, you know, making sure that you, people have PMF, I think is key. 
So the way that we would define PMF is really just your demand outstrips supply. And uh, we experienced that um, over, you know, we've experienced iterations of that throughout the, the last couple of years, but more importantly, over that COVID period where, you know, we actually made our product for free because uh, we saw the need for our product in the classroom. It became an essential tool and necessity for so many classrooms around the world to go digital overnight, uh, to not have any, um, to minimize the amount of disruption and learning loss in these classes as much as possible. So mm -hmm. um, we knew that we had a solution. We um, worked hard to become that. And once you're an essential tool and a necessity, it's hard for people to then go and turn around and say, we're not going to use this anymore. We're not going to pay for it, right? So um, mm -hmm. that's that's how we've been able to do it. And we've done it in a way that's global from, from day one. Sure. You're speaking globally. Um, you were just telling me that you've been in the States recently uh, at, at some of the biggest uh, you know, trade events that you've ever been to. Tell me a little bit about the, the demand um, and the excitement that you're seeing over there. Yeah, so to give you some more high-level context, I think, you know, so we've got 35 million users around the world. 90% uh, of US schools use our product, um, but we're in over 180 countries. Um, and, you know, our... It's, it's great to be finally connected or reconnected to the rest of the world by being able to fly a lot of our staff back to where our customers are located and actually speak to them in person, um, being able to resume some of these physical conferences and interactions and be able to visit some of these classrooms in person you know, is something that we've been itching to do since um, the beginning of 2020. And, um, you know, I think it's, it, it's, um, it's, those few fundamental things of talking to users, learning, and then building and iterating quickly, that has um, meant that we're, we're able to be successful. Um, and then our users are incredibly excited, you know, being able to talk to us finally in person and show us some of the uh, challenges or new challenges that they're facing and how, um, and excited to see some of the solutions that we're able to present to them. Mm -hmm. And where are you at? Just give us an update on on your um, sort of capital raising journey. Are you uh, are you seeking capital at the moment, or how's it going? You know, fortunately, capital isn't a barrier to our growth right now. Um, you know, we are. I can see that there are a lot of other tech companies that are letting go of talent, which is actually great for our hiring plans. Um, but you know, in general, we don't have any immediate capital raising plans. Um, you know, I think ultimately the capital that we're getting is from our customers, luckily. So, um, mm. and that alongside being super capital efficient over the last couple of years has meant that uh, we haven't really needed to raise much capital. It's a great position to be in, I suppose, especially at the moment, as I referenced earlier, um, it is a bit difficult for tech, for tech company uh, valuations at the moment. Is that what you're, you're seeing out there in the market? Um, we're, we're not actively raising, so I'm not 100% sure. I mean, we haven't raised a lot of capital to date. It's, uh, we've only raised about 2.5 New Zealand million New Zealand dollars. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, thanks very much for sharing a, an update, Henji, with us, and um, best of luck for the future. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, having us and hosting us today.